Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first Invested in Queensland Investor Forum. I'm Sharice Mullen, MP. I'm the Assistant Minister for Treasury, and I will be your MC for today. May I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I also acknowledge our host for today, the Honourable Cameron Dick MP, Treasurer and Minister for Investment, and our special guest, the Honourable Mark Ferner MP, Minister for Agriculture, Industry Development and Fisheries, and Minister for Rural Communities. A very special welcome to our virtual audience, guest speakers and panellists. I'm very excited about today's forum, which is the first of three investment forums that we will be holding this year, targeting specific industry sectors, beginning with the very important topic of agribusiness. This forum is part of our government's broader investment engagement strategy, which also includes investor roundtables, interstate investor roadshows, though those have been more virtual than interstate this year, and a culminating in a proposed investor summit that we will be hosting next year. I have had the privilege of working alongside the Treasurer on his investment portfolio and the investment roundtables, hearing directly from the private sector and industry on opportunities and challenges. The message is clear. Critical to our economic recovery is attracting investment um, to our priority sectors that create jobs, drive economic growth and innovate our industries and people. Agribusiness, the focus of today's forum, is one of those critical industries for Queensland. It is one of our leading sectors. We have world leading technologies and processes and we are renowned for producing clean, green products. The sector has significant growth potential in both tradi traditional markets, including beef, horticulture, grains and food processing and emerging industries, including byproduct manufacturing, energy generation, biosynthetic product development, aquaculture and value adding sectors. This forum will provide an update on our agriculture investment in Queensland, where the opportunities are and why our state is a great place to do business. The forum will run for approximately two hours. You will hear from the Treasurer and other dignitaries, including Minister Ferner and Bob G, Director General from our Department of Agriculture. We have a very strong lineup of panellists and agribusiness agri expertise and knowledge. So this is your opportunity to learn, engage and ask questions. And it is my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, the Treasurer and Minister for Investment, the Honourable Cameron Dick. Thanks, Sharice. Great to be here with this very important investor forum today. Can I acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Yagara and Turrbal people in Brisbane, uh, the traditional owners of the land, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I acknowledge all of our guests here in Brisbane in our capital and uh, online, including those from around the world? Uh, can I acknowledge my good mate, uh, the farmer's friend, Mark Ferner, the Minister for Agriculture, Industry Development, and Fisheries and the Minister for Rural Communities. Great, Mark is joining us today. Uh, can I acknowledge my good friend Sharice Mullen, the Assistant Treasurer, who is uh, working so closely with me and the Treasury team in attracting investment to Queensland, which is what this forum is all about today. Can I acknowledge Bob G, APM, the Director General of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries? Can I particularly acknowledge the Trade Commissioners who are online with us today? We have Queensland Investment uh, Trade Commissioners from Japan, China, North America and our, our ASEAN uh, Trade Commissioner as well as Austrade representatives. And I want to particularly acknowledge you and the work you do for Queensland and our country around the world. You do a very important job linking investors to our state and linking Queenslanders in particular uh, to investment opportunities overseas. Uh, you are a critical part of this project and we're, well, we're so delighted to have you with us today and we welcome you. Today's session on agribusiness is being delivered by Queensland Treasury in conjunction with the uh, Queensland Department of Agriculture and Fisheries. And uh, I hope uh, sometime soon to be hoping, hosting an investor forum in person uh, with all of you. Until then, I appreciate the time you've taken to join with us in this virtual forum. Around the world, governments have learned one fundamental lesson in dealing with COVID-19. Managing the pandemic is not a binary choice between managing the health care of your people and managing your economy. They are both interrelated. 
A strong economic recovery can only be built on the foundation of a strong health response. And that is what we have demonstrated time and time again in Queensland. As a proud Queenslander, I can think of no better evidence of that than what we have been able to achieve in our state since the pandemic started. It is now 616 days since the 29th of January 2020. That was the day that Queensland became the first jurisdiction in Australia to declare a global health pandemic and a global health emergency in our state. And that was at a time when the virus was just a novel coronavirus. It didn't have a name. Since that time, of course, our economy has been able to rebound thanks to our strong health response in Queensland and the delivery of our plan for economic recovery. Queensland, for example, has added more jobs than any other state or territory since March last year. In fact, we've added more jobs than all states and territories combined. There are now 67,000 more Queenslanders in jobs today than there were pre-COVID. In New South Wales, for example, they are more than 100,000 jobs short of where they were before the pandemic. In the June quarter, Queensland's uh, economy grew by 2%, faster than Australia's domestic demand of 1.7% and far outstripping Australia's GDP growth of 0.7%. Household consumption in Queensland has, is 3.2% higher than last March. That's further above its pre-COVID level than any other state or territory. Private investment in Queensland grew by 5.7% in the June quarter. That's faster than any other state and almost three times faster than the national average growth in investment. And state and local government investment in Queensland grew by 5.1% over the last 12 months. But as vaccination rates increase in other states and around the world and jurisdictions are opening up, the big question for all of us is this. How do we continue creating more Queensland jobs and strengthen Queensland businesses? And how do we continue to grow our economy into the future. For the agribusiness sector, that means leveraging Queensland's existing reputation, as Sharice has said, as a world leading producer of quality, clean, safe, sustainable food and fibre. And in the not too distant future, we have uh, an opportunity coming to Queensland, an opportunity that will showcase our state to the entire world, not just hosting the biggest sporting event in the world, but hosting the biggest event in the world in our own backyard, the 2032 Summer Olympics and Paralympic Games. Queensland will not just be a place to visit, not just a place to compete, it will be a place for people to invest and grow their businesses. And that's what I'm so keen to do as Queensland Minister for Investment. Our government's investment facilitation program, such as our Jobs and Regional Growth Fund and our Advanced Queensland Industry Attraction Fund so far since our election in 2015 have helped deliver more than $2.5 billion in private sector investment in Queensland. And that investment by government and the private sector has created more than 4,000 jobs. That is a fantastic platform that we want to build on as we now motor away from COVID-19. Through the pandemic, our agricultural sector has been, of course, one of the great success stories of the Queensland economy. And to those of you who are uh, participants, uh, uh, investors, uh, business operators in the uh, agribusiness sector, I want to thank you. Uh, you've really been the mainstay of the Queensland economy and you haven't missed a beat since uh, the pandemic started those 616 days ago. Thanks to close work and consultation with industry and producers, we've been able to keep uh, producing food and fibre for domestic and for international markets. And the outlook for Queensland is looking really, really good. Queensland's winter crop production is forecast to rise 63% in 2021-22 as a result of increased planting and higher yields. Wheat production is forecast to rise 60%, barley 57% and chickpeas 71%. The outlook for summer crops is also good with sorghum production forecast to grow 24% and cotton up 40%. Better weather conditions have seen cattle prices rise to historic levels and they are expected to remain high for the rest of calendar 2021. It's from this strong base that we can look forward to building even stronger partnerships with business and industry. Our government's investment support and facilitation has seen many great partnerships formed during the past 18 months. 
We've seen the first of two regional trade distribution centres open at Wagner's Wellcamp Airport near uh, Toowoomba. That's the first and we're working on opening a second one in Cairns. I was pleased to see at that opening over 100 agribusiness representatives at the official opening, which will allow them to get more product from, their, from southern Queensland to more parts of the world in a fresher and faster fashion. Kerry Ingredients, a leading global taste and nutrition company whose food technology and innovation centre, excellence centre, I was delighted to open uh, a little bit earlier this year. That centre will also act as, new, uh, new, as a new headquarters for Kerry in Australia and New Zealand, so their regional headquarters right here in Brisbane, adding to Queensland's food innovation capability. Farm Fresh Fine Foods in Bundaberg are expanding their sweet potato production lines and their workforce by an amazing 45% with support through our job, Jobs and Regional Growth Fund. And in Bundaberg, Marquee Macadamia is one of the biggest macadamia processors in the world. They're expanding their production facility to increase capacity by 25% and create 40 new jobs, helping local growers take a bigger bite of export opportunities. Also, Hilton Foods Australia have opened their $280 million meat processing and distribution facility in Heathwood in the city of Logan, where I live, with assistance from our government, supplying packaged meat and vegan products to Woolworths and creating more than 650 food industry jobs in Queensland. Before I conclude, I'd just like to say this about COVID. It has taught us, it has taught us the need to react quickly to changing circumstances and to learn to adapt. And I don't think I need to say that. Everybody participating in this forum knows that. Changes in global income, agricultural production and consumption, consumer demand in particular, climate change and food security will all provide both opportunities and challenges to our agribusiness sector in the years ahead. Queensland is well positioned. In fact, it's positioned probably better than any other place in the world to lead the, this change in agribusiness products, services and know-how. But this will depend on having the right mix of investment and industry development programs in our state. To continue giving the private sector confidence to invest in Queensland's future, our government will keep investing in the sector and this uh, economy in Queensland and our state. Our rec in recent months, I've hosted a series of investor roundtables. By talking directly to the private sector and to industry, I can get your take on opportunities and challenges to fulfil investment objectives and provide support that can enhance Queensland's competitiveness. And I know Minister Ferner has done exactly the same with his virtual trade missions, reaching out, listening and engaging with our industry partners here in Queensland and of course internationally. It is great to see the cream of the crop with us here today. That's actually not true. Crops don't produce cream, that's the dairy industry. This is an issue we will explore later today. But it is great to see some leaders from across business and industry with us here today. Uh, Agripower, uh, Ornitas, Sunpork, Wagner Corporation and Australian Country Choice. They're all here today, companies that have been part of these uh, important discussions for the future of our state. Through these sorts of engagements, business leaders like yourselves are assisting our government and Queensland in moving more private sector investment forward. You're also supporting, very importantly for our government and for our state, more jobs, more job opportunities for our people, and uh, that will allow us to secure a strong and prosperous future for Queensland. So thanks again for participating. We've got some great panellists here today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and I'm really looking forward to working with you as together we invest in Queensland, grow our state and create more opportunities for our people. Thank you, Treasurer. That was a strong start to our investment forum. Our next session is on agribusiness investment, environment and climate increasingly important considerations for ag investment decisions. This session will begin with a presentation from Ms Katrina King, General Manager Capital Solutions at Queensland Investment Corporation, followed by a panel discussion. Katrina has over 25 years experience in financial services and is responsible for originating research, product innovation and product governance at QIC.
Katrina works with our investors to bring product solutions that meet their members and clients' needs in a range of alternative and liquid assets. Can you please welcome Katrina? Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for hosting today and thank you all for having me. As um, said, I am Katrina King, General Manager for um, Driving Capital Solutions at QIC and bringing new products and, our, and solutions to our range of both global and domestic investors. I also would like to pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and in particular acknowledge their connections to land, sea and community. And this acknowledgement is particularly pertinent today because I do plan to provide an overview of how QIC is working with the innovation from the Queensland Government to talk about how we see institutional investors in agribusiness and providing both environmental and climate goals. Sorry, I just get my... Firstly, a little bit about QIC. We were formed by the Queensland Government over 30 years ago uh, and have now over 92 billion in assets under management. We do have a large portion of those um, in Queensland that we manage for our client base. For example, the Port of Brisbane, the airport, Cross River Rail. But importantly uh, for today, I'd like to call out our investment in NAPCO, one of the world's largest livestock and farming operations, spanning at least 1% of the Australian land mass. But it is our track record in asset stewardship particularly in real assets, that puts us at this exciting position of sharing our insight in agribusiness, natural capital, and why Queensland is offering such attractive opportunities for our global institutional clients. Firstly, I'd like to define what we see as natural capital. It is a nature-based solution that provides both goods and services that emanate from the land, soil, water, and from ant, animal and plant species. It's really important that we understand that it is this stacking of returns, firstly from a commercial farming perspective, but then also adding on to that an environmental market return, for, for example, carbon credit units or reef credits. And then finally, these solutions have positive environmental and social co-benefits, for example, jobs and other social benefits that can be brought to the community. I wanted to talk about why this is compelling for our institutional investors. The next, this chart shows three different pillars. Firstly, the drivers that comes from government. We know that there are sweeping climate changes, regulations and policies. We are seeing the uh, federal government, but also we know that the Queensland government has a 2050 net zero emissions policy and more and more governments are moving towards this as well. But it's not only this policy as Mr. Dick said, it is the healthy economy and the healthy, health of the people that would also need to be promoted with these objectives. Secondly, the investor demand. In 12 months, I have seen an exponential amount of growth from our institutional client set looking to have net zero emissions and sustainability built into their investor solutions. The trick, though, is that ESG solutions cannot be offered to our client base at a cheaper rate of return. They all have fiduciary obligations to either, in the form of Queensland Government, the taxpayers, or in the form of our superannuation clients, of course, their members. And these returns still have to be met. So it's really looking for solutions that can give these ESG credentials at the same time as delivering commercial returns in what we're looking for. 
And this is the excitement that natural capital solutions brings. It's the environmental outcomes and markets. It's the stacking of commercial agricultural returns with the benefits that you get from carbon credit units, but also looking to community to give rural and in other Indigenous partnerships opportunities as well. So by doing this stacking, you are creating a virtual return cycle that's bringing healthier outcomes to Queenslanders overall. The next page is, um, a, 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 I admit, a fairly complex diagram, but there are two main points to take away from it. Firstly, as we look at these carbon offsets, it is really important to understand that the environmental market can offer a premium quality of carbon offset. Because the extra benefit that environmental solutions gives is that they remove carbon emissions in, from the atmosphere. Now, this is different from simply avoiding them, such as many of the uh, energy renewables initiatives do. And for this reason, investors are seeing it as a premium way to access carbon offsets. It will attract a higher price premium, particularly if married with other co-benefits. We will get more clarity around how the institutional market and the global market is thinking about this as we move into COP26 at the beginning of November. But we are looking to provide a solution, as you see from the bottom of the page, that will marry the sellers of these opportunities with the buyers who are a range of governments and private institutions that can deliver these carbon offsets for them. Now, this is an asset class that you want to be long. We're only just starting to see the beginning of the demand for this asset class. We know that people have 2050 goals, but there will be 2030 targets along the way. The estimate is that for us to meet the global scale re required to reach the Paris target of one and a half degrees, we have to grow the voluntary carbon credit unit 15 times by 2030 and over 100 times by 2050. The benefit of the Australian Voluntary Carbon Credit Union is that it has a integrity which our offshore investors are extremely interested in. There is a rising demand for high quality emissions and, renew and removable offsets. And this is because of the, it is, the um, Australian system is supported by a really strong regulatory framework. Now that I've made the case for being long these credit units, I want to talk about the opportunity that Queensland provides. This is a slide that was put together by an association in Australia and it is so compelling. It shows you from a macro level, Queensland can offer six to seven times the opportunity in carbon credit units that New South Wales or Victoria can offer. This is because of our size, but also favourable rainfall and high conservation value of some of the opportunities that we have in Queensland, for example, the Barrier Reef. We need to show leadership now, and this is why the Queensland Government and their natural capital vision has asked QIC to implement a platform that will establish a fund to attract global institutional capital to develop our environmental markets and to protect the important um, areas that we have, such as the reef. We are showing this leadership in Queensland, but we can branch it out to the rest of Australia once we have established it here. So in conclusion, after defining natural capital, its key drivers and why environmental markets are such a great opportunity to harness net zero emissions goals, talk about the, spoken about why the um, carbon credit unit price is only set to increase and the huge opportunity in Queensland. We're very keen to partner with our offshore and domestic clients into realising this government's natural capital ambition. QIC has an ownership structure that lends itself naturally to this public-private partnership. We have an existing real asset capability at scale in sustainable land management. 
as Kate will allude to, we have an extremely strong responsible investment brand and ESG alignment, institutional grade governance, and a specialist asset manager. So thank you very much for your time to hear more about QIC's perspective on the exciting opportunity that is being offered by agribusiness in Queensland to solve one of the most pressing economic challenges of the next few decades. Thank you, um, Katrina, for your insightful presentation on how natural capital solutions can be an attractive asset for institutional investors and why Queensland offers the most opportunities. So let's, deal, let's delve a little deeper into this. It's now my pleasure to introduce Kate Bromley, the General Manager of Responsible Investment at Queensland Investment Corporation. Working closely with the QIC board and executive team, Kate leads and implements QIC's ESG strategy and works with QIC's investment teams to apply ESG integration strategies to all of QIC's investment team processes. Kate will moderate the panel session as well as introduce our panellists. Please welcome Kate. Thank you very much and thank you Minister for hosting today. Good afternoon everybody and a warm welcome to this investor panel on Queensland's agriculture sector and investment credentials. It is my pleasure to facilitate the discussion today where leaning into the global trend towards sustainability and responsible investment, we will draw on the insights of a range of industry experts and key stakeholders to share perspectives perspectives on how the investment on how investment in the agricultural sector is evolving and what makes environmental and agri markets attractive as an investment but first i will introduce our panelists today we are fortunate to be joined by leon allen under treasurer queensland treasury katrina king global Glo general manager capital solutions queensland investment corporation tim samway Chair Pack Horse, a cattle property manager seeking to become a global leader in the practice of regenerative agriculture. Bert Glover, founder and manager, managing director at Impact Ag Partners, which specializes in asset management in agriculture as an impact investment. And Andrew Gatenby, chief executive officer at Carbon Link, which provides end-to-end -end services to deliver carbon projects to reduce emissions. Welcome to you all and thank you for being with us today. Can I also at this point um, just remind our audience members joining us that if you would like to ask questions, please do so by using the speech bubble icon in the bottom right of your screens and those will enable me to pose those to our panelists as we move through the discussion. Well, I'm going to start proceedings by uh, beginning with a question to you, Leon, if I may. And the, the question is around what are you currently seeing as the pathways available for potential investors in Queensland at the present time? Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And I would clearly put myself in the key stakeholder category, not the industry expert category, just to make that very clear up front. But as evidenced by uh, the, the Treasurer's opening remarks, and also by Katrina's presentation, the government is very invested in this space. And we do um, want to belong and we want to belong uh, into this space. It is about uh, an upfront patient investment. Uh, as a general rule, uh, we are always interested in making sure that Queensland, regardless of the industry, is positioning itself to both local and international investors as a genuine investment destination. So we're always looking to ensure that we're making ourselves uh, competitive and that that investment turns into very productive investment. So that's, that principle applies wholeheartedly to this space. So in terms of creating pathways, that is the framework and the mindset that the, that the government has rightfully adopted when it comes to positioning. And you can see that by the evidence of the Treasurer's involvement today. And then in the agri space, um, 
I think we can talk to the fact that there is such a strong industry pedigree, and not just our presence in that space because we've got quite abundant natural uh, resources, you know, natural capability, but we've got a long-term uh, track record of innovation in this space. Sorry, I keep looking over to the lectern and not to the camera. And um, I think that is e exceptional credentials when it comes to providing pathways. And that, I think, is, is, is critical because we do want to leverage the investments that we've made in the past and minimise the transaction cost of, of, of uh, transitioning and transforming what we're looking to do into the future. And then I think the other component in terms of pathways is uh, a government that's invested in that, in that transformation and has um, quite uh, uh, openly signalled its intentions in this space uh, previously uh, through the uh, Land Restoration Fund and then most recently in the last budget the Treasurer announced the Carbon Reduction Investment Fund. And that is providing a long-term funding source for that land restoration activity. And then you saw Katrina also reference that we're setting aside capital also to help seed the Natural Capital uh, Fund as well. They are very significant, albeit long-term investments that are already underway. So in the land restoration space, already the first round, just under $92 million invested in 18 projects that will realise all the benefits that Katrina spoke to. So very positive start, very strong momentum, terrific sponsorship by both the Treasurer and the Minister for Agriculture in this space and the Minister for Environment as well. And great to see that government has joined up and focused on these opportunities. Thank you, Leon. It's great to, to hear the, the momentum that is underway. I'm going to turn now to, to consider um, the perspective from, from one of our investors, and I'm going to ask Tim, um, what kind of social and or environmental criteria are influencing capital allocation decisions into investment projects? Well, um, my experience of 25 years, uh, I was with Hyperion, a great... Uh, Equity manager that manages about $13 billion on behalf of Australian investors. And uh, over that, that time, the thing that I noticed that uh, when we were first pitching for institutional money 20-something uh, years ago, um, the ESG component was the part that was in page 16 of your presentation pack and people just checked to see if it was there. Today, uh, unless you've got sustainability at right at the front of your pitch pack as an investment manager, you don't have a hope. It's virtually the first question that's asked. Um, usually um, the ESG person or the head of ESG sits in on meetings. That didn't happen 15 years ago. That might have been a phone call you got after a pitch just to check on one or two things. So it's the, the whole investment scene has completely changed. Uh, and uh, you just can't get anywhere without sustainability being right at the front, the forefront of, uh, of what you're offering. That's part one. Part two is uh, the, the carbon story is now becoming the most urgent part of the uh, ESG. So, you know, there was the E, the S and the G. Now it's environment carbon. And as you rightly point out, the opportunity for carbon credits is very substantial. Um, clearly, emissions reduction is the first prize because that, that really has the, the most effect. But uh, there's a lot of emitters who are deluded about their, their ability to actually um, reduce their emissions. And so the opportunity to sell carbon credit units to them in the future is going to be substantial. And Queensland is very well situated to be able to do that with agriculture. Thank you, Tim. Bert, could I perhaps ask the same question of you in terms of what you're seeing from investors or perhaps in your own experience in terms of what ESG criteria is driving and influencing investment decisions currently? Well, thanks, Kate. And I think, um, I think one of the key things to, to carry forward from what Tim was saying is um, our investors, primarily based offshore and in the Northern Hemisphere, um, whereby this emissions discussion um, and, and how do we reduce emissions and, um, you know, get more carbon out of our atmosphere into our soil and vegetation. It's a very advanced discussion in the Northern Hemisphere. And for us, um, we have seen capital come to us for deployment and management 
whereby people are looking for a nature-based solution. And it just so happens that this nation called Australia has a lot of natural assets that are conducive to, um, you know, restoration, preservation, conservation. Um, and so the investors that come to us are looking for a nature-based solution. They're looking for um, track record in the space. So they're looking for those who have demonstrated um, the capacity to sequester. And in the example of soil carbon, how have you sequestered soil carbon in the past? What should we expect in the future? And what are some of the co-benefits? So how are we monitoring and measuring biodiversity? And, and how are we going to um, you know, improve some of the great natural assets that we have in Australia? And how are you going to measure those things? And, They've been, historically for us as a firm, we've done that through our impact reporting, um, but we're starting to see now more robust methods of that sort of measurement. And so we have to use a lot of data to demonstrate what we call a baseline situation and then using our experience and our data sets to say, look, under our management or under a certain style of management, we can move forward and project how we think we're going to interact with that natural capital and what the improvements are going to be over time of that um, of that asset, and what those natural capital benefits are going to be as a return, and can they be monetized? Because I think our position right now is that agriculture's got a real opportunity here to be a leader in this space in terms of emissions reduction, and we really think investment in ag can catalyse change. And I think it's up to us now to take this forward. And in terms of Queensland's case. I think it's really well positioned to say, look, we've got some great natural assets here in Queensland. And if we look after these assets properly, um, get on board with in terms of innovation, improve our markets for natural capital, create more opportunities for those land custodians, then I think the opportunity is there for us in Queensland. Katrina, you mentioned in your keynote earlier that the trend you're seeing amongst institutional investors to commit to net zero emissions targets at 2050. From the institutional perspective, what are you seeing in terms of ESG requirements, in terms of investment decision making? And I'm going to throw a two-parter at you. Are you also seeing um, the location of investments playing a factor in driving that capital allocation to date? Thank you, Kate. Uh, there have probably been uh, three different industry bodies that we're aware of in, in the last uh, 12 months or so that have announced sort of signatories uh, for net zero emissions targets. I think the most compelling one is the Net Zero Asset Management Initiative. Um, as of December last year, it had 28 signatories. It, sorry, and it 30 signatories, it now has 128. It represents 43 trillion in assets under management. And just to give um, everybody a, a sense of just how big that is, it's probably about a third of global funds under management. Um, there's also a, a UN um, convention, which is similar, the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which has about 7 trillion in assets under management. And then the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change, which has 38 investors representing eight and a half trillion assets under management. So with these bodies, you can certainly see the wave of capital is moving towards requiring this. Now, when we talk to our investors about these opportunities, you're quite right. Um, I, I think I mentioned um, some of the benefits that Australia generally has because of its strong regulatory framework. Um, I think that we've all become, well, we've all probably known, but um, the global market has become a lot more aware of greenwashing with some of the things that have been announced recently by the IMF and, and their large sort of concern and lens that they're putting on that. But I think Australia, with their regulatory oversight of the voluntary market, um, is already well in front of that concern. Uh, then it's interesting to note um, sort of what provides a premium over the sort of generic spot price of carbon credit units. And for Australian investors, it is that proximity to where they are or where their operations are. I think for your member base or your, your you know, ultimate investor base, if you can tell a story 
right, clearly we have this smelter or this mine here, but look, right next door, we have um, a carbon credit offset. So that proximity um, it also has significant value and increases a price premium for that as well. Thank you, Katrina. Leon, I'm going to momentarily um, seek your views on where do you see the opportunity to meet this demand? Uh, thanks, Kate. Um, in the, uh, I think, descriptions we've already heard about Queensland's, you know, abundance of natural resources um, and our relative success in, in um, both uh, translating those resources into a successful uh, agricultural industry, and we've seen within that very successful uh, agricultural businesses, some of those participating today. Uh, but we've seen it in other sectors in terms of manufacturing and tourism. And that shows, uh, I hope, to investors the strong level of stewardship that uh, the government can point to uh, when it comes to uh, that uh, translation. Um, and I think the movement that we've seen in investments made, but also in, in accounting for our environmental, um, our, our social and our, and our governments and governance performance, uh, there is, I think, a genuine embrace that's underway that wants to demonstrate that all those features that investors are looking for can be demonstrated here. And absolutely, there's always more to be done and we can absolutely re refine uh, the, the product. Uh, but we can also, I think, point to the track record uh, in sustainably developing uh, the abundant natural resources we've got and, 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 um, and the cohabitation of industries that can occur. And I'm sure there's examples that people might provide to the contrary, but I would argue that there's been, uh, for argument's sake, a very successful development of, of, of uh, the LNG industry, and um, and that um, has then been followed by a very successful development of renewable energy industry, and I think uh, that underscores that issue around uh, track record and the credibility that that brings for investors is really important, and uh, now we'll see the government's commitment through a range of initiatives we've already touched on around its commitment to helping foster environmental markets. And, and as I said in my response to the earlier question, Kate, is, is that uh, the, the government is in, very invested in that and uh, the $500 million commitment to the Land Restoration Fund to provide a long-term funding source for then uh, uh, both in direct investment but also to co-investment. So it's a willingness to sort of leverage the balance sheet uh, judiciously when it comes to investment into new uh, sectors and new opportunities. Um, you know, these are all very positive features. If I was an investor sitting on the other side, I'd sort of uh, point to. And then to the extent that we've got very strong partnerships, both within government, with QIC, the ability to leverage the capability that sits there, and also I think with industry. Um, government has been very active and invested in the industry and they're very keen to continue that and to really take advantage of the opportunity, which is delivering on the commercial uh, imperative that all investors into the agricultural sector would have, and that's primary. I think Katrina mentioned as well that this has to balance out our, our strategic objectives around the creation of um, you know, good securities as environmental offsets, but to the layering of, of those opportunities on top of the core commercial requirements and investment into agri. And I know from the portfolio, the agriculture and forestry portfolio, fisheries portfolio, that we've got a real focus on ensuring that we enhance and improve the commerciality of uh, the industry, because only at that point they can they do this additional investment that we're looking for. And, and the government is saying, well, we want to put some money on the table too and put some skin into the game. And I think that's a really important signal. I'm not sure well. what you're saying, but you've just cut out to us that are online. Yeah. We just did. OK. Look, I, 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 um, I might leave it there, Kate. Um, okay. Obviously, it's having a profound impact on the quality <laughs> of <laughs> Breaking the internet. Thank you, Leon. Look, I'll, I'll keep moving forward. Um, Andrew, I'm going to, to touch now on, on agribusiness in a more focused way. Would you be able to share with us what you're seeing 
um, in relation to your direct experience, the current investment trends impacting agribusiness and specifically your industry and, and the areas that you're working in currently? Thank you, Kate. And look, it, um, it's a pleasure to be here today to present to you all. It's an exciting time for agriculture, and, and you know, I think that the best is ahead of us. Um, you know, the agribusiness more generally, and, and we've seen you know, the foundational pieces of our industry. Investors have come in and bought land and managed and traditionally run those operations across the you know, beef and livestock and horticulture and so forth. But you know, the, the other speakers, Tim and, and sort of, um, Bert, have certainly um, talked about these things in terms of ESG and the questions are getting asked. And I think. You know, it's now what else can you do be up above and beyond the, the core piece of the business and, you know, not just the environmental piece but the value add and post farm gate and, and we're seeing, you know, certainly um, significant opportunities in tech, in the f supply chain and, and value add in areas like aquaculture, um, uh, animal inputs, feed inputs um, and then behind that with the tech pieces, the data and, and how do we man you know, measure what's going on and demonstrate that through the supply chain so that when it gets to the consumer, they've got absolute quality about the integrity and the provenance of that product. And if we step back into the natural capital piece, it's around, you know, demonstrating that those carbon credits or those natural capital or biodiversity credits we've been talking about, they're actually real and it's in transparency around that and there's a real quality. And I think, you know, we're going to see the, you know, the, the industry as a, as a whole, there's a great opportunity to sort of um, demonstrate and showcase the strengths of our agriculture. Um, but by having that data and measuring and managing it, an opportunity to sort of prove that. And then it all comes down to uh, other things like risk management as well for banks and insurance companies, having comfort that in their portfolio, their, um, their clients, if you like, are not only doing the right thing, but can be shown to do the right thing. And so we're seeing a whole raft of um, people talking about different parts of the supply chain, investing in land, investing in water assets, how to invest in productivity to, to grow the businesses, but then the layering on top and, and the stacking we've talked about earlier, these things are starting to come to, come to, the, come to the forefront. And for many um, agricultural type businesses, it's in, in some ways getting paid you know, and recognised what they're already doing. And then for us as a business like Carbon Link, you know, we're a service, in, service company that's working to, you know, with, with groups like Pack Horse and Impact and others to sort of um, prove up things like soil carbon, which is, we think is a, a significant opportunity for Australia. Queensland has the scale, has a track record of really solid companies that have done well over the years. So we think it's um, you know, a really exciting time and, and, and really positive for agriculture. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we have, I'm going to move to our last question and I think we will quickly jump to some questions from our audience, but I can't, conduct an investor discussion without touching on data and methodologies, um, at least briefly. So I was wondering if I could pose the question, focusing on the methodologies, how critical are these along with the data? Uh, are they to investment decision making and attracting investors into this space? And I'm going to put that question to you, Bert, if I can. Thanks, Kate. Well, they're both critical. So for us, um, baseline data in doing due diligence on an asset and then, you know, using that as, um, that, that data integrity is really important, whether it's GPS located, um, tested in the same site every year, um, using the same labs, um, you know, same method used, it's critical. And we wouldn't have been able to sell the million dollars of soil carbon we sold to Microsoft in February this year if we didn't have that data over the last 10 years to help demonstrate um, what we have sequestered. But also moving forward, I think to Andrew's point around the importance of data, it's also about demonstrating the co-benefit. So what tools and data do you have to demonstrate um, the co-benefits? Because we see a time where we see premiumization in terms of the soil carbon and the markets that come with it, whereby you might be sequestering soil carbon, but you're also improving water quality and you're improving biodiversity outcomes and vegetation. So without data points, without data sets, and without being able to do that um, economically, I think we're going to find ourselves somewhat stuck. So there's still some, some work to be done there. And I think if that measurement and method uh, piece gets um, somewhat improved, we're going to be able to see more markets opened up and more choice for landholders. So we really need the majority of the custodians of the land in Queensland to be able to have access, we don't just want the innovators in the agricultural space 
um, to help drive this. We need this for, for the mainstream so that we can really have urgent impact on drawing down atmospheric CO2 emissions so we can meet our climate goals. And, and that's going to take improvements in markets and methods and technologies. And um, we've been doing what we can with the tools we've got for a long time now. Um, and that's enabled us to extract some value, but there's a lot of value we still cannot extract because, you know, the technologies aren't quite there to help us measure them in a robust way that's fit for purpose for the, for the investment community. Thank you, Bert. Very briefly, Leon, is there anything you'd like to add on the subject of methodologies and data in the agribusiness space? Thanks, Kate. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by re referencing that point around, uh, you know, very interested stakeholder, not industry expert. But I, I think there's a marketability if uh, Queensland is invested in the methodology, again, to the investment proposition, uh, and it's alluded to in Bert's uh, commentary there, that we have the opportunity to provide investors with certainty, and we all enjoy certainty, and that will improve the quality of the assets that they see in our jurisdiction. So, you know, investment into this space is really important, it's critical. And I think we've got, uh, again, to allude to what Bert's touching on there, is to really provide um, alternative um, uh, uh, income streams by starting with really good um, baseline data. And uh, from that point, we can then, again, with clarity and certainty, provide investors with uh, the right uh, asset class for, for them to invest. And we'll have, uh, I think, the world's uh, attention focused on us um, if we do have the integrity. Uh, it's really critical. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's formative in, in the, in the uh, life of people like me looking into this industry. And that's, that's a repeated issue around that data quality piece. It's critical. It's critical in everything we do. But in this case, I think it's something we really need to lean into and make sure that we get the right um, investment in that part of the whole um, investment opportunity. Thank you, Leon. I'm going to, to round up with one of uh, our audience questions, and this is from Tag Adachi at TIQ. Um, the question is, many international investors who are currently invested in Queensland mines are expected, uh, are also exposed to net zero targets um, across each country or company while, com while contributing to Queensland mine rehabilitation assurance funds. And the question really is, could some of this money possibly be directed to the QIC Natural Capital Fund in future so that investors could receive a credit? I'm not sure who to direct that question to. It's a bit of a market functioning well, uh, question. Is anyone game to, to have a go at that? I think the audience might be a little tired of hearing from me, but I, I do note that that uh, financial provisioning scheme sits within Treasury. And uh, it is, again, I think a clear signal of, of the government's environmental credentials in having established as much as possible a market-based mechanism to ensure that mine re rehabilitation is part of that whole industry investment proposition. And that's a really, it might have been an impost, I think, if you went back, you know, some time to industry saying this is, you know, adding to the cost, but actually perversely now, that's a real uh, attractive investment feature for uh, mm -hmm. people investing either in existing uh, resources in this state or even the areas where we want to go in terms of new minerals. So I, I think we need to really uh, rec recognise that as a genuine asset mm -hmm. for, for investors. And to the extent to which it then can be parlayed into creation of um, environmental offsets, I think that's probably more to do with what do we do with those areas that we have created. And um, uh, we're just running a provisioning scheme to make sure that there is a fallback if, if for whatever reason, uh, some people can't or some companies can't meet their liabilities. But companies themselves can look to, well, what investments mm -hmm. do we make in land rehabilitation that will create mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, securities that can be perfected and then and, and sold to investors or, or reinvested into other uh, business cases? So that's where I think the opportunity lies there. Oh, but I'd welcome input from my uh, panel colleagues on that and online. I, I, would, I would agree. I would say yes, and I, I think some of the... Uh, investor conversations that we've been having, perhaps not so much along the lines of 
uh, you know, having a rehabilitation program in, in Queensland Mines in their investment profile at the moment, but they are businesses who have their own risks in those areas and are looking towards the Queensland opportunity to offset those risks. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense to think about those two in harmony. Thank you. And while we could uh, spend much more time speaking on this subject, we really are up against time. So that's all that's left for me to do is to thank our panellists for today, uh, for your insights and contributions, and to hand back over to Cherise. Thank you. Thank you to Kate and to our panellists, Leon, Katrina, Tim, Bert and Andrew for their um, advice and insights. Um, and, and whilst online participation is always a little bit challenging, if you do have any questions, do please share them with us. And whilst we may not be able to address them all in today's session, we will ensure that our panellists have access to your questions for follow-up contact. So thank you. We will now take a short three-minute break as we prepare for the next session. And I invite you to enjoy this video that will be played during the break. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second session of the forum. This session is on Why Queensland? And we begin with Bob G, Director General of the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, providing a presentation. Bob was appointed Director General in early 2021. Prior to this, he was the Director General for the Department of Youth Justice and Deputy Police Commissioner, Regional Operations. Bob's priorities at DAF is to work with industry and rural communities to create the conditions to drive innovation, sustainability and jobs for a productive and profitable agriculture, fisheries and forestry sector. Can you please join me in welcoming Mr Bob G. 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us online. Hello to a lot of friends and some graduates of UQ out there. And I mention that specifically because I think we've got a great research capability in this state. But can I firstly acknowledge all the traditional owners of the land on where, wherever you are and all cultures as well. I think it's really important, particularly in investment forums, to understand culture and how that impacts on investment. Can I acknowledge all the ministers, the treasurer, uh, the assistant minister, and my minister in particular, who has uh, been a blessing in my role in terms of his total commitment to trade and reaching out to people. I'm going to try and frame uh, really quickly a couple of issues that the panel then wish to discuss with you. Uh, if there's one message you've got from me is that I am really proud to be part of a leadership board, a cohort of directors general, uh, working for a government that understands the commercial imperative. Uh, economic policy and social policy are joined together. We understand the commercial imperative and I'm very excited about the opportunities we have to work with you. For me, there is a great opportunity at the moment. There's a convergence of opportunities. I just want to go through them really quickly. Uh, clearly, Queensland's a great place to live, invest and visit. But if you think about market intelligence and access and what trade can do for us, it requires mutual benefit. Uh, there are links to national security and a whole range of other perspectives that are broader than agriculture and today's session. But I, the point I'm trying to make is there's a convergence of opportunity. Food security, we all know that there is not enough food in the world but there is a great opportunity for us to continue doing what we do well in this space, in this state. The enabling infrastructure, both public and private in this state, is incredible. It's something that builds a great base and the supply chain and the opportunity to move up it and across it is untapped. Uh, there is great potential there and I'm gonna move to that very quickly. But also trust, uh, we are safe, we are green, we are fresh, and we are healthy. We have premium products that are well-priced. Price, 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 we are well-priced. We have world-leading science and technology and data credibility and some of those things that have been talked about in the earlier session, I think, are core to where we're headed in that space. We have uh, untapped skills, and all of these things are converging to intersect with a changing consumer and a consumer preference uh, issue. Uh, for me, reliability and quality, new products, ESG credentials, traceability and provenance intersect together. Can I just address a couple of the things around low emissions roadmaps? I am overwhelmed with the support, uh, particularly I've got to give credit to the peak uh, industry groups in this state. Uh, as soon as I took over the role, I went to the minister. The industry is very keen, that small and medium enterprise, to work through low emissions. And we're working together with them on a low emissions roadmap. It'll stand us in good stead. And yes, I think there's work to do in uh, more work to do around technology, around data credibility. My predecessor and I actually spoke to that at the Rural Press Club recently. Uh, and I think that's just core, but we're well on our way. Um, there is a great opportunity for us in this state. Uh, the value proposition for me is about how we move from this great base to uh, a, a bigger potential. The consumer and the market has shifted. Most of you know that online, but just so we've got a shared understanding, there is a potential, particularly in the food tech space, to move to new products based on health and wellness. Uh, traditional proteins give us a good base, but there are other proteins. The circular economy, waste utilisation, supply chain and digital transformation converge together to allow us to have great traceability great brand, great provenance, based on outstanding biosecurity. And I've got to give agritourism a plug as well. I think as the economy opens up, you'll see more and more in that space. Uh, I won't go into our natural capital base, but I do think it's important to continue to remember we're in the Southern Hemisphere. That gives us a great comparative and competitive advantage. And we can do tropical and subtropical like no other. Uh, supporting all of this, uh, hundreds of millions just in government investment alone 
in research de and development, specifically for the Queensland market. Now, for me, those things converge. And if you look at how Queensland's situated, our history teaches us this. Uh, and if you look at the map, our supply chains are second to none. We have a great opportunity to move into closer regional supply chains. And some of the things that have happened in the private sector, uh, Wellcamp, the work at Wagner's, those sorts of things are a great opportunity for us all to stop and think about. I want to move very, very quickly though to a couple of other key points and talk about this, I think, great opportunity in the next seven to eight years around food tech. But before I do, can I just point out that this state has you know, billions of dollars of worth of capital occurring and to a point earlier made around you know, the question around mining sector and natural capital management, I think there's great opportunity to look beyond ag and to see how sectors cross over. And one of those sectors I think that uh, is really important for us is Queensland moving towards becoming a clean energy superpower. Have no doubt that we have reliable, stable energy, but we are moving to clean energy. And if we think in an investment horizon of seven to 10 years, that sets us up for something special in this state. Uh, there is great opportunity though in the ag tech and food tech space. Uh, you know, roughly $12 billion a year after Farmgate, if you go paddock to plate, $25 billion a year. I can't find any literature or evidence that suggests to me that we don't have an opportunity to double that, at least double it within seven, eight, nine years. Very simply put, I'm very interested for you to ask the panel about that, but that's where we can head very, very quickly. Uh, demand preferences have changed, but our food and fibre uh, production in this state is a huge base on which we can jump. Uh, for me, though, ag tech uh, shouldn't be thought of just in terms of ag tech, it should be thought about in terms of uh, food tech as well. We've already touched on this afternoon uh, issues around productivity and low emissions improvements through energy, feed, supplements, water monitoring. Uh, artificial intelligence and the meat, uh, egg industry, hoard industry, it really doesn't matter. Data analysis and robotics already here and we can export that to the world as well. Uh, this government's invested substantially in ag tech spaces. The heat map's obvious. If you look at Bundaberg, the Sunshine Coast, um, Toowoomba, all great opportunities and the far north is still very, very untapped and my colleague will soon go through a couple of examples in that space. Uh, where do we fit as a leadership board, as a, a body of directors general, and as a department? We speak with one voice, whole of government. So uh, I want to follow up with all of you online as we uh, move forward over the next three to four years to make sure that we get that investment mix right. And can I just leave you with just one or two little messages before I conclude? Could you stay the course with us? COVID has taught us, and so has this state's response to natural disasters in the space, if we stick together, we'll move through that. this. Uh, I'd be disingenuous if I didn't say to you, I think that we will have some disruptions over the next 6, 12, 18 months. But if you think about where we're headed as a state, uh, our, our great strength is to be able to stick together and to move through that. And I guarantee you that uh, this government and I, my department, will continue to, what, to do what we do well, and that's to support you. I think there's a couple of quick things I wanted to say before I threw to the panel and uh, Paul next. There is still great opportunity in linking beyond ag with other sectors. Uh, we have world leading infrastructure. There is scope, you all know it out there, there's great scope for investment to collaborate and consolidate with existing small and medium enterprises to grow value added new products services to more diverse markets. I'll say it again, small and medium enterprises, great people doing great work, but they are looking for us to work with you to help them expand. And it shouldn't just be around container ships full of material. We really know that we can value add in this state. There's thousands of jobs, that food tech opportunity, tens of thousands of jobs uh, available there in the very, very near future. It just will need a little bit of investment and you will have our support in that space. The way we conduct research and development in Queensland, particularly in agriculture, particularly in our relationship with 
all of the universities. UQ is number two in the world. That hasn't happened by mistake. They were 23 10 years ago. We're in a relationship with them that's lasted 10 years. They're now number two in the world. But we are moving from a single problem-based approach to a programmed approach. And I think that's really important for investors to know that if you come to us with broad problems, we'll work on them together. Uh, I'm going to conclude by just thanking everyone for their time. Give you a guarantee, though, that there is a committed leadership approach in this state to working with you. The commercial and economic imperative is second to none. Thanks very much. Thank you, um, Bob. And uh, it's clear, I think, an underlying theme that there's really no better place in Australia to invest than in Queensland. I'd like to now introduce the next speaker. Mr Paul Wormsley is the General Manager of Rural Economic Development in the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, and he's joining us online from Rockhampton. Paul oversees the delivery of a broad range of services from sites throughout the state. Paul's team exists to connect industry to opportunity, to facilitate the growth and sustainable development development and diversification of the agricultural sector and associated supply and value chains. Paul will now provide an overview of the investment potential in Queensland regions. Are you with us, Paul? I am. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. So I will give you a quick overview of what we do as the Rural Economic Development Team within DAF and a few examples of what that means from an economic development perspective across the state. So we do exist to connect industry to opportunity. We work with investors to realise these opportunities by providing information, referrals, and where appropriate, a concierge service to help investors navigate the Queensland planning framework and to assist investors to make informed agricultural investment decisions. We work with other government agencies, local government, Commonwealth agencies and industry, whoever's appropriate to help facilitate opportunities in partnership with investors. So on to the next slide. Economic development outcomes are achieved through structured engagement with individual agribusinesses, industry groups and rural communities. This slide, and you can't read the word, so don't try, is a, is a demonstration of what it is we're trying to achieve through our one-stop service. So we, we work collaboratively with economic development organisations to achieve agribusiness development and diversification priorities in the regions. Our stakeholder engagement processes maintain place-based development agendas that inform planning and prioritisation processes. We apply the one-stop service philosophy, which involves assisting investors where there's a roadblock in the investment process. Our staff are there to engage, introduce and lead investors to the relevant contacts, as well as assist in working through any issues. From a trade and market development perspective, we work with investors, Trade and Investment Queensland, the Department of State Development Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning, with Austrade, industry groups and agribusinesses to identify and promote opportunities to attract and secure increased domestic and foreign investment to Queensland agriculture and supply chains, and to identify and develop new domestic and international market opportunities for Queensland agricultural products. A case in point from an investment perspective is the growth in the aquaculture sector. You'll hear me refer to uh, a lot of success around the aquaculture sector throughout this presentation. We played a critical role in investments from Victoria and Tasmania in navigating the regulatory and approvals process and, those, and, and in commencing those operations in Queensland. So the next slide. Diverse regions and abundant opportunity. Our business our agribusiness development staff are spread across the state, aligned to the three regions as depicted in this slide. Queensland is a large state. As Bob has outlined, the opportunities are real and they are now. In the north, we are seeing public and private investment, tangible evidence that is demonstrating both the opportunities and possibilities for agricultural development. Water remains a key enabler and there is still work to do to enable the north to fully realise its development potential. Our involvement in the Flinders and Gilbert resulted in a review of the water resource plan, which then delivered an additional 700,000 megalitres to the overall allocation available for agricultural development. This is resulting now in serious new investment in properties and infrastructure to transform the region to a mixed cattle and cropping sector. The amount of cotton being produced in the North now is leading to interest in the development of a cotton gin. 
In the north, you'll see pulses, sorghum and grapes growing, demonstrating the great potential that exists. We rep represent the interests of agriculture in planning scheme development, and we are keenly interested in supportive of infrastructure developments that enable agribusiness growth. The Yemala inland port east of Emerald is a good example of an infrastructure investment that's achieved economies of scale, efficiencies and improved return for growers, investors and participants in the supply chain. Positioning agribusiness in these planning scheme processes is an important role to ensure enabling infrastructure and agricultural interests are protected and well understood. Our ports and airports are strategically important assets. Well Camp is demonstrating great potential. The Gladstone Ports Corporation is looking at opportunities to better utilise the Port of Gladstone. There are freight and logistics opportunities and the port's footprint contains land that can be developed for complementary industries that value add or provide supply chain efficiencies. One of the key draw cards for this area to potential investors is that it is in a state development area. State development areas are clearly defined areas of land established by the Coordinated General to promote economic development in Queensland. The broader Wide Bay Burnett region has been earmarked as a strategic growth area and the Queensland Government has commenced work on a 25 year development plan for the Wide Bay Burnett. Agricultural development, particularly value adding, will be front and centre in that region. A combination of government and producer investment into cluster fencing is a game changer and enabler that is seeing a resurgence in sheep and goat numbers in Queensland. The Queensland Sheep and Goat Meat Strategy clearly demonstrates a range of opportunities to ride this wave from production to processing through to the provenance and value chain developments that will flow from this opportunity. Regional agricultural development grants as announced by Minister Ferner last week will support investment in this sector and provide a mechanism to maximise the economic impact of the investment in cluster fencing. Following a Queensland Competition Authority report into the aquaculture sector, the department set upon a path to target those critical decision points in the investment process to provide certainty for investors. Aquaculture is not easy to locate. There are numerous geophysical requirements for a location and a number of regulatory triggers. The exercise of defining aquaculture development areas in the state planning policy has now effectively completed the hard yards to define, define sites that have the most favourable aquaculture characteristics and the least regulatory constraints. There is now over 9,000 hectares identified in the state planning policy and local governments such as Rockhampton are now championing these opportunities to actively seek out investment to grow aquaculture in their local areas. So let's move on to some examples. And again, in aquaculture, with the announcement of aquaculture development areas and the release of the Queensland Competition Authority report, Queensland set about actively targeting and supporting aquaculture investment. It's the fastest growing protein market in the world. After many years of single digit or static growth at the end of the 20, at the end of the 2019-20 financial year, Queensland recorded a 40% growth in production. We're expecting the same value and volume when the figures are finalised for 2020-2021 financial year, noting that these financial years were also impacted by COVID-19. The Queensland aquaculture sector now outstrips the wild caught fisheries in production. For this sector in particular, we have, adop have adopted the one-stop service approach in, it, in assisting investors through this complex environment. The basic of investment, remove uncertainty, de-risk it for a clear return on investment. Ag aquaculture is a complex topic. There are a lot of broad legislative and regulatory triggers that need to be navigated. The value add in this sector has huge potential, but not just in the product output side of the equation. These aquaculture operations require feed production and large supplies of plant proteins to go into feed manufacturing. Based on a 40% growth in production, there also has to be a 40% growth in demand for the valuable inputs required for this sector, and this demand is growing. 
the jobs and business opportunities for Queensland in supporting growth in aquaculture are broad ranging. Water infrastructure. Government investment in infrastructure is no different to the commercial sector and for water in particular, we need to see uptake and maximisation of the potential from water storages. The Rookwood Weir is an example of DAF's philosophy to maximise opportunity for investment. Water infrastructure is not necessarily a case of build it and they will come. We've been working for more than a decade to describe the opportunity, to provide certainty around the options and to de-risk investment. We've engaged and partnered with those stakeholders who have a vested interest in seeing these projects succeed to provide coordinated support for investors, such as local government, economic development agencies, science groups and state planning agencies. And the end result, the first tranche of water tenders is completed. It was oversubscribed with large investors entering the market, securing land and looking to progress significant projects and take land to a higher value use. The final tranches of water tenders are being progressed in engagement with landholders to define areas that will maximise uptake. From all indications, it's looking as though the water opportunities for Rookwood Weir will be oversubscribed. Land use change to maximise return on investment is likely and the weir isn't even complete. This in itself is a significant departure for how governments would do business in the past. And this work is entirely focused on investment, growing jobs in our communities. The investment opportunities that's, that sits in front of us now is in the supply chain to value add, manufacture, take advantage of and maximise the impact of the construction of Rookwood Weir and the investment that's occurring and creating change in land use. Let's talk protein. It's estimated that there will be a 285 million metric tonne shortfall to meet demand in protein over the next 15 years. Demand is driven by population growth and increased wealth. It's estimated that animal meat production will peak in 2025 and the shortfall will need to be derived from plant proteins. The rising demand for alternative proteins has already started, and this provides an opportunity to attract, pro to attract processes, but also grow our pulse crop industries to meet the rising demand. Our staff are actively working to support investors looking to develop processing capability and supply chains for plant-derived proteins in Southern and Northern Queensland. I hope that's given you some insight into how we connect industry to opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. No doubt our regions are ripe for ag investment and I appreciate your very comprehensive presentation to us today. I would like to now introduce Tom Murphy, who will be our panel moderator for the next discussion and will also introduce our panellists. Tom is the Head of Agriculture and Regional Investment Strategy at Queensland Investment Corporation. He has over 20 years of experience in public and private institutional investment across the US, UK, and Australia. He joined QIC in 2018 to develop QIC's long-term agriculture, natural capital and regional investment strategy and was appointed a director of the North Australia Pastoral Company Board in 2020. Welcome, Tom. Thank you very much for that introduction and I'd like to welcome our panellists, obviously, to the Queensland Agribusiness investor forum and to the key theme of this panel which is why Queensland and you know I think that's a really important question because I think sometimes in these sort of forums you forget that investment is relative it's a relative game you don't you can't just be a good investment opportunity you've got to be the best investment opportunity and better than the other investment opportunities that investors have and I think we've got a really good range of, of specialist skills here in the panel to address that question you know, what makes us differentiated, not just to other states, but to other um, offshore investment opportunities? You know, what, are we, what do we have in Queensland? What are we doing in Queensland? And what do we have to do in Queensland to continue to, to attract uh, investment both domestically and internationally? I'll introduce the panel. I mean, Bob G, Director General of Department of Ag and Fisheries. Bob's been introduced, but 
you know, I think the audience may well be surprised just how deep and diverse um, uh, Bob's experience is in rural and regional Queensland across a lot of different fields. You know, he wasn't obviously, he was Deputy Police Commissioner in, in regional operations, but also he, ha he was the State Disaster Coordinator, he was Queensland Reconstruction Authority Board, his Director General Department of Youth Justice, and also very deep experience within research and, and academia. So. Um, thanks, Bob, and uh, good luck with the new role. Richard Watson, Acting Chief Executive Officer of Trade and Investment Queensland, which is the government's leading agency for facilitating trade and investment into all industry sectors, including food and agribusiness, both here and offshore. Brendan Goulding, Director, International Services Bentleys. Brendan has been working in international trade and investment since 2001, initially with the Queensland Government Agency and now with Bentleys pursuing export market opportunities and attracting international investment with a focus on food and agriculture. Brian Ruddell, MD and founder of Impact Innovation Group. Brian has been involved in ag and food innovation for over 25 years uh, across global markets and has also worked with some of the world's largest organisations designing innovation programs and research teams in the development of new products and services. And notably, and he'll probably touch on it today, he's Chair of the Emerging Industries Panel for AgriFutures Australia. Al Fullerton, Managing Partner, Mandalay Venture Capital Fund. Al has recently been appointed as the Entrepreneur in Residence at the Toowoomba Ag Tech Hub and has worked in venture capital fund management for the past decade. And over the last 30 years has founded Ag Tech and renewable energy startups across the entire ag supply chain from Australia and Asia. And Scott Parkinson, Chief Executive Officer Ornatis. He's joining us virtually, so I hope Scott can hear us. Uh, he's, I think he's dialing in from Tasmania. Scott has been involved in Australian aquaculture for 32 years in senior positions across R&D, commercial operations and sales, from building greenfield facilities to redevelopment of aquaculture facilities throughout Australia. And Scott is currently leading the team in the commercial production of land-based tropical rock lobsters a first in the world project based in Townsville, Queensland. I just want to make one point in terms of questions. We'll obviously uh, pose a series of questions to the panel, but just in terms of the virtual audience, you'll also have an opportunity, obviously, to ask questions. In the bottom right-hand corner, there's a bubble, so feel free to post those questions. Hopefully, they'll come through to me and we'll have time at the end to put that to the panellists. I might open with a question uh, to Bob. Um, Bob, in your speech, you touched on consumer-driven demand influencing investment opportunities in Queensland. It'd be good to explore your thoughts further on that, and can you sort of elaborate on that topic in, in relation to the state? Uh, thanks, Tom. I'll be really quick. Uh, first and foremost, they want safety. All the evidence not tells us that. But consumers have changed beyond quality. Um, I think you can de-risk in this state. Uh, you know, you've got safety, you've got quality, you've got taste, but they are now looking for a different range, new products, and you don't, everyone online I think gets that. It's not about um, one single experience, it's about the whole meal. I think there's some interesting things that might happen. Genetically modified foods was a challenge, particularly in countries like Australia, but the, what genomics will lead us to is an ability to move very quickly and take up some opportunities. Um, you know, that ESG tick is critical. And for what it's worth, I think the role of influencers uh, and a healthy lifestyle is underestimated. But de-risking here is, um, I think, a great opportunity given we have great biosecurity, good uh, food security, uh, safety and a stable environment. Yeah, thanks, Bob. And I think that, um, just in my own experience in terms of international investment markets, you can underestimate the premium that Australia, and particularly a state as Queensland, has got in terms of that stability, not just stability in governance, but the stability in our institutions, stability in, our, in terms of law and order, the rule of law. And, you know, I think increasingly, particularly versus a lot of the markets that we compete against, particularly in the developing world, that premium is, is still a major factor, I think, in terms of particularly international investment. And I think on that point, it'd be interesting to ask Richard Watson, in terms of his own uh, experience in terms of Queensland's trade and investment, and maybe Brendan Goulding as well, just to sort of open up in terms of, from a high level, this sort of attraction of Queensland from an international investor perspective. 
it's really the key question, I think, today's theme is what are the key things that investors are looking for in making a decision on an investment location in terms of your own experience from an offshore perspective? Terrific. Um, thanks very much, Tom. And look, I, I think I did want to acknowledge, as the Treasurer did earlier, um, I think as the, um, uh, the government's dedicated trade and investment arm, I want to acknowledge a couple of our commissioners that are online today as well. So Julianne Nichols um, from China, uh, Tom Calder from Singapore, Takadashi, who we've heard questions from already from Japan, uh, and Vicky Forrest, who's uh, up late at night in North America as well. So uh, a, a shout out to them, uh, and certainly um, from Vicky's perspective, based in San Francisco, uh, from an investment perspective, uh, we have an office in New York as well. So uh, a special shout out to them uh, today in joining us online. And I'd certainly encourage um, clients online and others to really take advantage of that international network that is out there from a trade and investment perspective. Um, to your question, Tom, um, timing's as good as ever, I think, for ag. Um, the sector has been able to hold its own during the COVID, um, this COVID period. Um, and with the spotlight of the world on Queensland as a result of the announcement of the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics, we need to take um, the opportunity to take advantage of that, of that timing as well. And that's certainly coming through the discussions um, through our international network. Certainly from a, a TIQ perspective, um, the Queensland's long-term economic recovery will depend on our, um, on our global engagement for both an export and an international investment perspective as well. And so over the last 12 months, TIQ's focused its efforts not only on its um, traditional markets, but also new markets and, uh, and chasing new channels to market as well. And so from a trade and investment perspective, from a trade perspective, uh, we're opening new offices in Vietnam, but importantly, from an investment perspective, uh, we're reaching out and opening an office in Germany as well later on this year. So we recognise that we've got to position ourselves. And I think, as the Under-Treasurer mentioned earlier, um, it's about making sure that we've got the framework and the positioning um, to make sure that we're as competitive as possible moving forward as well. And so what are the investors asking us? There's a couple of key questions that... Uh, they're floating through our team. They want to know about the tax environment. They want to know about uh, the climate, the infrastructure and the supply chain. Uh, they also want to know about the, regu the regulatory environment that they're in as well. So they're all key parts of it, but I think what really underpins the way in which trade and investment can really add value in the market, and um, Bob touched on this a little bit earlier, it's about being a joined up government in this space and also having that one voice. So that the ability for us to collaborate and consolidate the work that we do, that we find that whilst a lot of people will look, uh, when they're looking at investment, oft, often one of the questions asked is about the incentives that are offered. Uh, we're finding more often than not that um, what the investors are looking for is a really connected up government, a way in which the we can make sure that if we're working with our colleagues in DAF, state development, um, or in Treasury or the environment portfolios, that they're really keen to ensure that we've got that joined up uh, process internally to make sure that we can give them speed to market and access as well, which is from feedback we're hearing through our surveys is a really significant point of difference that we're able to create from not only our domestic competition locally with New South Wales and Victoria and others, but also what's happening in our international markets. Oh, uh, thank you for that. And I guess, um, Brendan, you know, you've got some interesting experience in terms of coming from a Queensland government agency. Uh, so here you are at home. You probably feel at home today. Uh, but also, obviously, from a large-scale international advisory group in, in Bentley. So, you know, just elaborating uh, on those earlier comments, what are you sort of seeing from a private investment perspective? Yeah, thanks, Tom, and, and thanks for, for having me along today and the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, look, I feel like I'm back amongst friends here, which is great to, to be here after working in TIQ for a number of years and prior to that, the Department of Agriculture um, in Queensland and now moving on into a commercial role where I've been for the last several years. Um, I guess just from my perspective, my role at Bentley's, I, I head up the International Advisory uh, Division there along with our merger and acquisitions team. And our firm, a big part of our focus of our firm being a business advisory and an accounting firm um, is, is specialising in agriculture, food and agriculture, working with food and agriculture clients. Uh, and a lot of my day-to-day -day role is to work with clients that are looking to attract investment into their business and touching on, on the point earlier on, um, to get them ready for that process, to get them what you know, is termed usually as investment ready. Um, we're fortunate as well that we do work with a number of clients that are investors, institutional investors, that have invested in agriculture in Queensland, um, invested in a range of industries. So 
fund managers, for example, from the US, the UK, uh, private organisations from Asia. So we're fortunate that we have, have exposure to both sides of the coin in terms of uh, the opportunities as well as what investors um, are saying to us that they're looking for. I think just, just to, to talk about a, a more sort of macro perspective um, from what we see when we get asked from investors about, about what the opportunities are to invest in, in Australia and in Queensland, um, you know, some of the things that, that really stand out for us and when we have our discussions with them is, is looking at more of the macro, macro environmental uh, variables to start with. So in terms of the economy, how, how it's performing, um, and Queensland's got a pretty good track record going through the, the COVID period um, and good growth prospects going forward as well. Um, an economy that's largely remained, you know, open through the, the, the COVID period um, and, and, and traded at least into, excuse me, internally. Um, touched on before by, by several speakers, we in Queensland are really, really, uh, really fortunate to have a, a very strong agriculture industry with a strong industry industry experience um, in terms of capability and know-how, um, really strong industries in terms of big commodity uh, production uh, industries such as beef, such as cropping, um, cotton, etc. And, and when we talk to some of those investors, they, they, they talk about timing and when to get into the market. It is a long-term view, but in terms of the performance of agriculture um, in Australia as an asset class in Queensland as well, um, more, more specifically, um, timing is good. You know, the, the asset class is performing pretty well. Um, it's performed well both from a, a production perspective and also a valuation perspective over the last couple of years, which is, is no mean feat considering what we've gone through economically um, through external, external shocks from COVID um, in terms of the global economy. The supply chain, really important. The integrity of the supply chain um, and the, the systems, um, the know-how, um, food safety, absolutely critical. I think that'll be a trend that'll continue on, you know, going forward when we get asked questions from them about how does how does the, the supply chain perform here in, in Queensland and Australia? How is it connected to global markets? Where is the opportunity to connect into those markets and, and service some of those markets with with um, with demand, burgeoning demand coming from from uh, regions like Asia um, that are growing at exponential rate. Can Queensland tap into that? Can Australia tap into that? Is it connected into that? And our, our response is absolutely. Um, in a number of industries, a number of big commodity industries such as beef, such as grain, etc. Um, and also the the external sort of macro factor of you know what, how how do we operate in the Queensland economy? What's the regulatory system like? What's the rule of law like? You know, is is there certainty for us if we decide to invest into this sector? Um, and by and large, absolutely there is compared to other other investment alternatives um, across the globe. And the very fact we're here today, you know, at this at this forum, you know, demonstrates the fact that the Queensland Government is certainly very supportive of looking and encouraging external investment into this part of the world. So um, we're very, you know, we're very fortunate to have all of those factors running in our favour. And I think it presents a very strong, compelling um, investment proposition from some of those international investors that are looking at getting exposure to agriculture as an asset class. Thanks, Brendan. No, that's a great, uh, very, you know, a question that you know, spans a, a lot of uh, really interesting topics. And I think, you know, the interesting thing on, on performance, it's, you know, I think everyone in this room tends to be related to agriculture. We're all very comfortable with what the agriculture, you know, what the investment attributes are of agriculture. But it's, it's an asset class and still many ways when it comes to institutional investment is not yet sort of classed within traditional asset classes. It's still in many ways seen as an alternative investment, which is always quite surprising given the, how long agriculture has been around as an investment. But, um, but, you know, I've certainly seen through COVID what's, you know, interesting from QIC's perspective, we own North Australian Pastoral Company, one of the largest livestock companies uh, in Australia, and, and it was bought under, a private under the private equity division at QIC, namely because there was no other division within QIC that probably should, could have actually bought it from its mandate. Um, but of course, the, you know, there's a lot of sort of grumbling amongst some of the more established private equity players talking about the return profile versus their usual portfolio. But during COVID, that was completely reversed. And it was one of the best performing assets through the whole private equity portfolio. And that was also the case with our international investors in Mark that during COVID, that held up as one of the best investments. So it's certainly been tested in the last 12 to 18 months and, and um, is, is coming through. Um, I might just... Uh, 
relay the same question to Brian and Elle in terms of, you know, what are, what are investors seeing in terms of, you know, what do they need in terms of investor location? But where your experience is interesting is in that earlier, earlier stage opportunity in terms of venture capital and commercialisation of opportunities and innovation. So I might start with you, Brian, to sort of answer that question. You know, what are you seeing in terms of potentially maybe investor thematics, but how do we convert, how are we as a state in terms of converting opportunities into reality from an investment perspective? And maybe, Elle, you might want to follow up in terms of the Ag Hub as well and that whole concept. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Tom. Um, I think it's really interesting that about I think about 10 years ago, we started talking to some um, VCs in the US and, um, and what we were finding was that they didn't really rate Australia or Queensland as a, as a place to come for ag tech. Mm -hmm. And um, so what, uh, through some TIQ discussions and things like that, uh, there's been a lot of discussions over the years and through that, we managed to get a few of them to come out and uh, it was really fascinating to see their, I suppose, reaction as they started seeing pictures from a lot of uh, ag tech companies, from a lot of the, you know, the, the hubs that are being set up. And um, I suppose the quality compared to uh, what they were seeing, uh, not only in the States, but also in Europe and, and other countries as well. So I think through that, it's been a, a hard road, um, both from a VC perspective, but also corporate investment into ag startups that uh, there's been a lot of uh, groups that have been pushing and uh, raising awareness. And that's starting to really pay dividends. We're getting uh, more and more interest uh, from, again, you know, corporates in the ag tech sector looking at investing in startups and earlier stage technologies in Australia. Uh, but then, um, you know, I suppose they're also getting in there and, and sort of actively looking. They're setting up their own offices over here in some cases. And uh, it's a, been a really interesting space from that perspective. So that's on the ag tech front. Um, and Tom, I know you mentioned in the, in the intros, I'll probably talk about emerging industries. And I know um, when we talk about emerging industries uh, from an agri-futures perspective, uh, we're talking about new ag emerging industries rather than uh, talking about biomanufacturing and things like that. Uh, but this is another area that we're seeing a lot of uh, interest from not only traditional investors in agriculture, but also uh, non-traditional investors. Uh, so uh, this is sort of investing in um, you know, new emerging industries like uh, seaweed, uh, like uh, industrial hemp. Uh, you know, we're getting into non-shattering varieties of sesame. Uh, there's a whole range of insects throwing it out there. And there's a whole range of uh, these new emerging industries uh, that are coming through that are providing really interesting opportunities uh, for traditional agriculture to start diversifying into other areas. Uh, but then also, as I said, uh, non-traditional groups, corporates coming in, uh, wanting to build out supply chains. Uh, we've had uh, you know, a, a lot of groups from, from Asia in particular, but also Europe, wanting to invest in these emerging industries because they actually form part of their supply chain in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, I think these are some really interesting areas that are starting to emerge when it comes to uh, what investors are looking for, but then also looking at what we can offer from a Queensland perspective. Uh, because a lot of these emerging ag industries are being produced at small scale at the moment in Queensland. Uh, but this is a really interesting opportunity that they can expand quite rapidly. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Al? Yeah, thanks, thanks Brian. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, continuing on from that, it's interesting that, that um, relationship with the US investment and venture capital space, where you're now seeing US venture funds sidelined because the valuation of investments in seed rounds is so high now that it's almost become unbearable. And over here, you start looking at... Um, you know, the, I guess at the early stages of venture capital where we are and how that's evolving. Um, by default, agri-food tech has an underlying ESG thematic. So by default, investing in early stage agri-food tech, you actually tick that ESG box. But, you know, investment in agriculture and sustainability are actually one in the same and, and as is profitability in that space. So um, I guess what we've been seeing in, in the venture space in Australia is the emergence of uh, venture capital investments. What that has meant is that there's more support of innovation, the more innovators are coming forward you know, and everything that we're, we're hearing throughout today was about generating 
alpha, it was about sustainability, it was about alternative proteins, and all this ultimately stems from innovation. I think that's why where venture capital pay, plays such a critical role in the ecosystem, and I think that's been a key uh, missing component in the Australian ecosystem in our commercialisation because you know we have a hostile environment. We don't have any sort of subsidies in terms of food and agriculture. So what we do is that we produce innovation coming from real life challenges or opportunities. So it actually works in practice. Mm -hmm. And then here in Queensland, we've got uh, industry who can validate the innovation on our doorstep. So it's not coming out as being sort of a shiny object that you then go and look for a, a home for. In Australia, you actually, your innovation works in practice, but the problem that we've had is that the challenges in attracting investment capital in it um, has meant that, that, that quite often some great innovation uh, has taken a long, long time to potentially get to that stage of, of being utilised there. So what we're seeing, for example, with the, the Ag Technology Logistics Hub down in Toowoomba um, is this uh, opportunity to attract innovation from all over Australia, but into an ecosystem in Toowoomba where you've got almost every, every agricultural vertical surrounding it. So you mm. want to test something in wine or you want to test something in hort, there it is right there and you've got all that sort of industry supporting innovation and, and the attraction of, uh, of capital there um, flowing through as well and then cross-pollinisation of ideas. So, you know, we talked a bit before one of the speakers was talking about, you know, the mining rehabilitation. Well, cross-pollinisation of mining tech into ag tech is amazing and mm. often these industries have the same issues. It's connectivity issues, it's access to labour, it's all these kind of fundamental issues are often across multiple verticals. So when we cross pollinise the innovation, it can work in different verticals and different um, sectors. Uh, I think that's something that Queensland's got going for it really well, is that we've got all this innovation in uh, you know, mining, food, agri, um, and some great mines, and now it's like the collaboration effort, and, and the Ag Tech and Logistic Hub has been a real leader you know, in, 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 in driving that. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I want to get to Scott to give uh, you know, a real life example of, of you know, his experience across the aquaculture industry. But I, I just want to follow up on the, the whole ag fund, uh, ag hub concept itself. And, you know, I've, there's a couple of obviously great examples globally, um, you know, the Netherlands, Israel, uh, in terms of, um, we talk about all of government, but in terms of some real life examples of countries that have seen, an, and they've seen it through the spectrum of national interest of how do they collaborate all of government from state, local, federal, how do they integrate and collaborate between industry and farmers and, and, and government um, across industries, be it energy, logistics, ag, et cetera. And, and I'm interested in, in, you know, given you're developing this ag hub, you know, what are some of the, what are some of the examples that you've seen internationally that we could bring here um, in a very real way? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think, you know, like I said, the crucial, a crucial component of the success of, and we're talking agri-food tech innovation mm. here, is capital. So, mm. you know, government grants and support can only last for so long in those early stages until there's a cliff and you actually need to be able to stand on your own two feet. So having an environment that's supportive of innovation, um, having interested, having venture funds in there who do provide that much needed capital is one thing. I think also, like we've seen technology mature, I think you've seen venture capital Mature, I think that gone are the days where passively investing in 100 companies and hoping a unicorn you know, generates your return are gone. Now you're seeing a focused portfolio where there's more what we call it sleeves up capital, where we actually get out there and we actually help navigate those early stages. And what that generates, or mitigates risk for our investors, but it generates alpha as you accelerate that venture towards its first milestone. So you're seeing more hands-on work, you're seeing more entrepreneurs who've been through that journey come and lend a hand with uh, new entrepreneurs so that they're not fumbling around in the dark, making mistakes. And, and so it, it, it breeds success. It's a really bad analogy, but you know, the All Blacks keep on winning because every young kid in New Zealand wants to be a rugby player. And if you have a, a, an ecosystem that supports and you get wins and you see those wins and you get more and more feedstock coming through. So the success stories that are, come, are going to come out from the ATEC and Logistics Hub will further drive investment and more innovators will come forward and it will be self-perpetuating. Yeah, and I think also that, that the you know, the, the whole example of WellCamp with that Wagner investment, you know, I don't think you can sort of underestimate the effect that has on the whole country yeah. to see, you know, a private investor putting capital into major infrastructure and it becomes a platform then for an ag hub because you're starting to bring in major infrastructure, transport, logistics into the whole into the it whole. It does. Spectrum. And the one thing I'll just very quickly add to that is that, you know, in Australia, agri-food tech needs to be export focused. Um, the market's not big enough to support 
agri-food innovation to, to, for you to distribute it just in Australia alone. So it needs to be exported. Mm -hmm. So the Queensland you know, ecosystem is very export focused. You know, you multiple airports. It's, you know, you've got two thirds of the world population above us in terms of demand for our food and fibre. Um, and so it's a really healthy ecosystem where you know, that there already are export focus and we need to be a, a focus on our innovation to be exported because food and agricultural innovation should be exported to the world because it's about food security, sustainability. It's about it's a global thematic, you know, agriculture. It's not just Australia centric, but um, it needs to be export focused. I think that's another thing that Queensland innovation has is it, we're very much focused on delivering our produce and our innovation to the world. Oh, thanks for that, Al. Uh, and um, I thought um, that it'd be good to round out that whole conversation with someone like Scott. Parkinson. I'm sorry, Scott, you probably felt left out of the conversation so far, but I think you're very important to this because, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, what does it take to have investors invest in a certain location? The whole, how do we integrate innovation, develop research and development? Um, you know, how do we overcome uh, the different levels of, of, of government uh, and integrate that and have a whole of government approach? And you've sort of lived this in your, in your own experience. Um, and, and certainly, in terms of your tropical rock lobster um, endeavour uh, that really spans across the country in terms of where you've come from uh, and dealt with a lot of different governments and a lot of different levels of, 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 of regulation. You know, what's your experience? In terms of everything you've heard on this panel, what's your sort of real life experience of that, this whole spectrum? And then, you know, what can we do in Queensland to help improve that? Yeah, so, but Tom, it's been a really exciting uh, project for us. Um, and look, really, to give you a bit of a background, uh, this is a world first for undertaking. It's based on uh, 20 years worth of research and uh, tens of millions of dollars of federal, state and, uh, and private investors um, investment over that time. Um, you know, and it's the holy grail of the aquaculture industry. So the rest of the world's watching what we're doing. Uh, we've undertaken a fair bit of work throughout uh, Tasmania uh, Queensland and uh, Western Australia, but we've really focused all our efforts now in Queensland. And, and three years in, we've got 22 staff working up in, in Townsville now. Uh, we've invested over $25 million. Uh, we've got our first tropical rock lobsters growing on site at the moment. And, and this is something that hasn't been achieved anywhere in the world. So we're pretty excited with, with where we're at. Um, but look, this wouldn't have happened uh, unless we sat down with a minister some three years ago at, this, at the time that he was announcing his expansion of the aquaculture industry in Queensland. So, look, you know, we were pretty excited to have that meeting with him first up. And then he directed us to a client-based uh, group within DAF. And that really facilitated our due diligence in the early days and has allowed us throughout the last three years to try to navigate some of the difficult regulatory processes that we've had to undertake. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're still disappointed to see that some of our processes, we're told it's two to three years before we get through the approval process for some of our capital projects. Uh, we've got money to spend today. And when you're told it's three years away before you can get that approval done when you're in operation, it's really quite difficult for us as an organisation. Yep. Um, so I think some of the certainty that we need as investors needs to be there. And look, as I said, we've got really good support from um, DAF, Treasury, uh, State Development, and the, and the group of people that we've got in those organisations really understand investment and what we're trying to achieve in commercialisation. Um, but some of the other departments really need to, I think, get some more advice on how they interact with uh, investors. Uh, and people that want to achieve a, a clear outcome. Um, we've got a very good environmental background behind us, but um, sometimes you turn up to meetings and, uh, you know, we are the bad guys. <laughs> and we certainly don't want to be that when we turn up to these types of uh, meetings dis discussing how we're going to move forward as, a, as an organisation. So that's certainly when we turn up. Timeframes around approval processes are really, really critical. Um, they're quite fluid. And when you think it's going to be a six month process and turns into two years, it can be really quite frustrating. So, um, and I think it's been mentioned a few times, Paul's presentation earlier spoke about it, but we need to have all government agencies um, working together and try to solve some of the issues that are there. 
and problems around some of the legislation which really restricts the capacity for individuals to support us in our journey going forward. So there's, there's work to be done there within the government agencies. We're really supportive of what uh, Minister Ferner and, um, and the other ministers have been able to do for us. Mm. But, um, yeah, for us to really invest really heavily now, you know, there's additional work that needs to be done, I think, to, to overcome some of those issues. Uh, thanks, Scott. And, and look, I'm sorry, it would have been great to sort of pursue more questions along that line, uh, but we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, look, I think, uh, to, your, to your point, um, you know, everything needs refining in terms of, um, you know, industry, private sector and government, and we're always in a, you know, a, a position of learning and trying to go further. You know, I think what's, you know, Bob spoke about the fact they've got a leadership group here at the moment in terms of DAF, um, in terms of Treasury, in terms of DES, that actually do want to get something done. And we're sort of conducting a project at the moment in terms of natural capital with the state government. And um, while all practices and, and processes mightn't be perfect, I think the intention is there uh, in the leadership group at the moment. I think that's a really good platform to start from. Uh, and when it comes to process, I think that's always something we always got to look to improve. So. Uh, look, I think on that point, um, I think as Kate said in the, the other panel, we could go on for another half hour to an hour, but I really want to thank the panellists. It was a really interesting um, uh, a conversation. Um, and yeah, we might pass it over to the Minister to close out. Thanks. Thank you, Tom, and to our panellists, Bob, Richard, Brendan, Scott, Brian and Al, for your convincing thoughts on why Queensland. We are now coming to the conclusion of the forum and it is my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Mark Ferner MP, Minister for Agricultural Industry Development and Fisheries and Minister for Rural Communities, who will provide a summary and some final remarks. Please welcome Minister Ferner. Thank you, Sharice. Uh, firstly, can I indicate this is such a privilege to be the inaugural Minister and the portfolio for this investment uh, forum. It is incredible that uh, we're in this position today, given the current circumstances of COVID-19. So I do congratulate the Honourable Cameron Dick, the Treasurer and also Minister for in Investment for this initiative. It is a sound, uh, well-placed initiative that we will see well into the future, the investment in not only agriculture, but many other uh, locations and parts of our portfolios right across the agenda in Queensland. Um, the Treasurer is a real champion when it comes to agriculture. He comes from a background in, in that respect, so, so does Cherise. So uh, I want to acknowledge that and recognise the effort that he's put in to making sure that today happens. But once again, his department has been uh, committed to drive further investment uh, in our state. And you only need to look at the, the subsequent budgets that were had over the period of time under the uh, Treasurer's uh, uh, example of what he's done, not only in agriculture, but many aspects of, of investment. I want to thank Queensland Investment Corporation as well for the support and planning of today's event. It's been a fundamental and uh, important event to, to have. Folks, I just came today before this meeting from a Australian uh, Chinese uh, Business Council and the, the questions and the, the direction and the desire of them was to invest in Queensland. So we are the focus, not only from China, but the world in terms of where we're heading uh, as a result of in not only agriculture, but a, as a state government. So I want you to consider that in terms of your, your further investments. I want to recognise the presenters, but also the panellists. Uh, both panellists provided a fundamental and uh, important perspective of uh, agriculture and the, the importance of investing in this area. So uh, why invest in Queensland as an investment uh, destination? You only merely look to, uh, to Queensland as a state that has more than 88% of its land mass in agriculture. So it makes perfect sense why you should invest in Queensland, particularly in agriculture. Um, one of the things I've been fortunate enough over the time in my uh, portfolio of agriculture to travel to some parts of the world through trade missions, and you'll find an insatiable appetite of those countries wanting our clean, green produce that Queensland has to offer. And that was demonstrated again today at the uh, Australian Chinese Business Council. So uh, thanks, thanks for those on, online, virtually. Uh, it's, it's 
one of the factors that we have today as a result of COVID, we're doing teams meetings, we're doing virtual trade missions, but we're getting by. We're engaging, we're collaborating and making sure we engage with not only uh, our partners, but also those that uh, wish to invest in Queensland. I want to give, pay a particular attention to Trade Investment uh, Queensland for the exceptional work they've done, uh, not only in, in Queensland for the investment of, of agriculture, but around the world, opening up new office offices. So uh, well done in that respect. Um, Scott Parkinson, I just want to thank you for your contribution. It's difficult online, but uh, I reflect back about three years ago when we came to Hobart, we recognised the potential there, uh, along with your business, as well as to sell. Uh, two Tasmanian businesses that have invested in Queensland through aquaculture, one of my passions, and it's great to see your, your investment uh, flourishing and we'll work together as we did then uh, through those other organisations and departments to make sure it is a success, because it is a world success to see uh, the, the growing of rock lobsters in captivity. I saw them down in Hobart, uh, but it's great to see the venture up there, uh, not far north of, of Townsville, uh, generating into a great protein market. So uh, our department, the Agriculture of, uh, and Fisheries, will make sure we'll work with the other agencies to support uh, this area and other foundation science, innovation and regulatory reforms. However, there is a key message here that we need to do in partnership with private enterprise as well. And we'll make sure we, we do that and continue doing that as we have done. We'll also, uh, the department will work with uh, the uh, Queensland Treasury, Trade Investment Queensland, but also the uh, Department of State Development, in Infrastructure, Local Government and Planning to make sure we assist those investors in, in their, and their representatives in identifying those new food, those new ag business opportunities right throughout our state. So on behalf of the Palaszczuk Government, I want to give thanks to your commitment in growing our economy, having the, the, the fortitude to make sure you, you look at the, the, the possibilities in terms of Queensland and the investment in food and agriculture sector. We do welcome you in the future uh, to engage with us as, as direct uh, contact, but also invite you to the Investment Summit in March next year. And I'm looking forward to being involved in that myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Ferner. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our proceedings today. We hope that you have found the forum valuable. I'd like to thank our host, the Treasurer and Minister for Investment, the Honourable Cameron Dick MP, and to all of our speakers and panellists for taking their time, the time to be part of our event today. Thank you also to our virtual audience for attending. A follow-up email will go out to all attendees with details on how you can get more information or ask any further questions on anything we have spoken about today. Today. Again, thank you for taking the time out to be with us. Have a good evening, or for some of our audience, a good morning. Thank you.